Um, welcome, this is Sean Roberts. I am a uh, chief technologist for Lincoln Network, and this is Lincoln Shorts. And I have with me Mark Collier, who is the chief operating officer for the OpenStack Foundation. Um, so it, Mark, the um, open source is typically thought to be the bleeding edge of in innovation. And the, um, broadly stating, we generally in the open source uh, space, we like to call ourselves a community. And I, I think it generally holds, especially for the work that OpenStack has done. There's, there's certainly a sense of community. Mm -hmm. it. Um, and I, I, for better or worse, I think there is somewhat of a sense uh, within the folks that make policy, typically around uh, the DC area uh, in the United States, but there are some other centers, but that's probably the most notable one. And they have a sense of community as well. Um, mm -hmm. they, but we don't speak um, the same language in a lot of cases. You know, uh, certain words have different meanings. Uh, we have different life experiences. Uh, uh, more of the people that are involved in open source have an engineering background and more of the people that have uh, involved in policy have a legal or po a political background. So we, we just have fundamentally different ways that we've been trained and in, in the way we live our lives. So um, heavy lead up. So uh, do you have a sense of um, how we can work together to make better products, which is hopefully uh, what everyone wants as uh, you know, we have to live in the United States and we have to use the stuff that we make. So uh, yeah. hopefully that's the, the end goal for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, what's interesting to me is kind of the role of standards, um, which I think are super, super important and, and, and vital to to kind of growing economics, growing, you know, markets is having certain standards, which I think uh, is where some of the, the policy work comes in. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think what you've seen over the past several years, the last decade since OpenSec started, you, you see that software in a lot of ways kind of is creating standards. It's not through kind of a standards body per se, but through kind of the practical, you might call it an industry standard. People argue over the word standard. We can argue over just about any word we pick, but I think that, you know, there's a practical sort of um, driven nature, I guess, from my point of view of, of the software engineer mindset, which is like, what problem are we trying to solve? Let's experiment. Let's try things out. And open source is one of the, the great enablers for that because you can download the code and, and try it out. And we, we were uh, just talking earlier about how when we started OpenStack, we had no idea telecoms would use it, but they were like, this seems to solve a problem we have, let's try it out. So that, that idea of like experimentation and kind of creating a level playing field or creating a market where lots of participants can, can compete and sort of innovate, I think it accelerates innovation. And, and, and I don't know a ton about, about the policy space, but um, I do know a little bit about it. And I think the CBRS example is one I would probably jump to where I feel like there's just been a really amazing, in my opinion, kind of approach that the, the government, the, the folks in DC are taking to that to create sort of a liquid marketplace for different people to share the spectrum. And that's combining with open source in some ways we can, we can jump into if you want. But I, I feel like that's a really good example of kind of the the partnership between the private slash open source developer mindset, which is like, let's iterate on some software to, to manage networks for 5G. And then, hey, we gotta have spectrum. We can't do this without spectrum. And suddenly the CBRS concept is creating much more accessibility. So you don't have to be one of the five or 10 most wealthy companies in the world to have spectrum. You can be you know, a small company, an innovator, a startup. All right. So that's a uh, citizen's broadband radio service. Something that's uh, interesting, and, uh, and it, I, I think it does kind of uh, get into this permissionless innovation that uh, typically um, organizations or maybe even the mindset of standards first, innovation net, uh, last, um, and the mentality uh, of uh, OpenStack and open source is standards through, in a, um, through implementation has been a popular rallying cry. CBRS and um, kind of that innovation uh, on the bleeding edge of where normally the carriers want to be the dominant force for obvious reasons, since uh, they, they, they want to gobble up all the spectrum, they want to own that space. Mm -hmm. um, and to a certain extent, the Department of Defense owns some of that space as well. They, they um, always get first uh, <laughs> well, to eat at the trough if, yeah. Mm -hmm. No in the big band of 5G, the Department of Defense actually, um, that's where their, ra uh, their radar systems operate. So there's uh, somewhat of a debate of uh, 
can they share? Because obviously they're not operating in all uh, places where they own that spectrum, but uh, can they share and how would that work? And there's, there's obviously debate on um, how such a system would work. Um, but getting back to what I started ranting about, which is permissionless innovation. Um, a colleague of ours, um, Boris Vinsky, has started uh, FreedomFi. Um, there's, a, there's a couple other companies that are similar, but I'm just going to call Boris out since I know him and uh, love the guy. Um, and obviously, we've worked with him and OpenStack Innovator. Um, that they're, they're going ahead and starting to build enterprise 5G stacks based on open source, mm -hmm. not waiting for uh, the FCC or other organizations to catch up and basically saying, you know, uh, this is a viable technology. Let's try to figure out how we build this on to the top of um, the, the capabilities of, of commercial companies, much like how TCPIP was the same, uh, the same thing where a few engineers finally got frustrated and, and uh, rather than waiting for the standards body to come up with the ultimate internet protocol, they just said, screw it, we're going to build one. Um, and, every, and everyone followed. So that was a whole bunch of ramp up. But uh, how do you think um, something like Enterprise 5G and, and kind of the permissionless innovation that's happening in that space kind of ties in with um, the, well, how do you think that ties into um, what's happening in, in open source um, since that's your expertise? Yeah, so a couple things I, I would say that um, in, in one of the things that's so exciting about it, is especially in like industrial IoT type use cases, like if you're at a Toyota factory or whatever, and you want to track everything that's going on, all the robotics, all the things that are happening on the line. Um, if you want to do that with, a, you know, it's all sensors, right? So more sensors means more data, but you want to connect it all and have like a real time look at it. If you do that with Wi-Fi, there's just a lot of issues with that. That's it's not it's not ideal. A lot of different, you know, a microwave oven can can disrupt the, the signal. I mean, it's just not really industrial grade. Wi-Fi is great, but you know, it's kind of that, that's very permissionless. You know, shared spectrum uh, to to a certain extent, and there's rules and everything. But but it's it's pretty it's pretty much the wild west. But with a private uh, a private 5G or LTE network, with like you were saying, Freedom Fi is building a product around this. You can build a dedicated network that's using the, the technology of, of cell phone, mobile phone networks, but it's dedicated to your company, let's say in your factory. And that just provides much better um, reliability, performance, and all the things that can, can make your factory more efficient. So it's really kind of uh, exciting to think that you know all, all the innovation that came out of, of Wi-Fi over the years, this, this can really kind of take it to another level with different latency profiles and just, just a whole different use case. And to be able to have that 5G spectrum that's leased in a very small area. So this CBRS system allows you to kind of reserve spectrum, but it's not for the whole country. It might be just for your factory's location. So there's no other factory there. So there's not really an issue because you're not getting it for the state of Texas or California or the whole country. You might literally be getting it for, you know, a very small space. So it's just much more efficient to make spectrum available in that way because you just don't know exactly how people will want to use it. So it opens up that that um, that innovation because when you don't know how someone's going to use it, that's sometimes the most the best way to approach it. If you try to predetermine every single use case, you're probably going to not think of, of all of them because the world is full of smart people with different ideas and different use cases. Um, so that's the beauty of open source, and I think you combine that with like this um, easy, um, very hyper local licensing of spectrum that's dynamic and can be reallocated. I mean, the, the future is super exciting. And, and the second thing I just want to get a plug for is, is there's a specific open source project, which Boris is, is heavily involved in called Magma. Mm -hmm. And our foundation, the Open Infrastructure Foundation is helping uh, to promote this, this project as well. And it's uh, magmacore.org is, is the website if you want to learn about it. But it came out of Facebook, who has some of the smartest engineers in the world when it comes to operating networks. And it's a mobile packet core or Evolve packet core kind of space to get into the, the lingo of it, but it's an essential part of a mobile network. And by making it open source, people like Boris can contribute to it, make it into a product, bring it into the market for like private, private LTE, private 5G through this, this scenario we were just talking about. So that's a, that's a fundamental building block that's really, really exciting. So Magma, I think you'll be hearing a lot more about. Awesome, very exciting project. Um, 
it does feel like we're on the, the cusp, the edge of a, a new frontier where um, mobile communications becomes the standard rather than, I mean, physical, physical layer has really obviously been dominant for the last uh, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, well, ever since, uh, you know, the transition from, uh, you know, mini mainframes and using uh, serial line connections, the mobile, excuse me, uh, physical packet networks have been really dominant for the last 30, 40 years. And we're just on the cusp of, um, I, it feels like to me that we're on the cusp of uh, mobile, mobile tel uh, communications becoming the de facto standard and uh, wired becoming um, le less, less so. But you know, yeah, I agree. That's, uh, that's just me just postulating. I have no inside information. <laughs> <laughs> so um, oh, it's a, a, a good way, to, a good place to close this out. And this has been Lincoln Shorts. Thank you.